All right, I am back on Warchant.com with Corey S. Clark, senior writer at Warchant.com, for another session of War Chatting. And Corey, what is this, number four, number five? We've hit a few. I believe it's number five. It's our fourth one. I believe it's our fourth one with a player, right? Right, yeah, the first one we did the 91 Michigan game. So, yeah, I guess we've done three players. This will be our fourth. And just I'll save the suspense. Uh, We're going to talk about the Florida, Florida State 2003 game in Gainesville, and we'll be joined by the hero at the end of that game. We all know P.K. Sam with the big touchdown catch from Chris Ricks at the end, and P.K. Sam's going to join us a little bit later to talk about that whole game, that big play at the end, kind of how that played out, the fact that he almost got mauled by a German Shepherd in the end zone, yeah. and uh, a little a little brawlage there at the end, see where he was uh, involved in that whole uh, halftime, or not halftime, end of game, midfield scrum, scrum that took place there, and uh, well, Corey, it looks like we, we liked it before and before we bring PK, PK on. I kind of like to set the stage of where Florida State was as a program and then kind of where this rivalry is. But, you know, for starting with Florida State, they go into this game number nine. They're nine and two. Uh, they had not had a 10-win season going back to 2000, the 2000 season, so they really, you know, right. wanted to get back on the snide. This is a really weird season when you go back and look at it because – this was a year that they pummeled North Carolina to start the season. That was the, the Greg Jones, Dexter Reed game, 37 nothing. And then it was the Notre Dame game. It might have been Chris Frick's best game when they went 37 nothing up in South Bend. But then, you know, there's games they get housed by Clemson at Clemson. This was back when Clemson was not the Clemson of today. They were just an right. okay Clemson team. And they just got destroyed. I went back and looked at that game. I didn't realize Florida State had only three points the last two minutes of that game at Clemson. They had 11 yards yeah. rushing in the game. So you're scoring 37 points in some games and you're effectively being completely shut down in others. And right before this game, they had the shootout with NC state and Phillip rivers that went to double overtime. So it was kind of a back and forth season for Florida state, but it looked like they were making slight improvements every season, you know, since that huge run they had in 2000. Yeah. And it ended up being the best season they had until 2012. I mean, and I, and I don't feel like 2003, I think 2003, that team had more talent than it than uh, it played with at times. Like there, there was no excuse for that team to lose to Clemson. Certainly not the way it did. Where I, I whatever it was, it was twenty six to three in the fourth quarter of that game. Um, completely outplayed in every way with all the talent that was on that team. If you just look at the defense alone, um, I think part of that was the quarterback was, uh, shall we say, inconsistent. Um, he would have some great moments, including this Florida game. He was he was terrific. He was always good against the Gators. So. I know people have some uh, ill will towards Chris Ricks, mainly because of what happened against Miami. But um, against Florida, he did his thing. You know, he was three and zero, or or he was he was he won two games. And if they'd have put him in earlier in two thousand four, he'd have won that game too. So um, you know, I, I think that was a lot of what two thousand three was. And you go into that game, I think you're eleventh. I think they're ninth. You just wrapped up the ACC title um, with that. Uh, crazy win against uh, – sorry, folks, I, I forgot I have hands and I knocked over my computer. Um, with the crazy shootout with Phillip Rivers. But in that game, Crofonzo Thorpe, on the mm-hmm. second to last play of the game, uh, breaks his leg. And now P.K. Sam had a nice year in 2003. He was a good receiver. But Crofonzo had a breakout year. Crofonzo was the star of that receiving core. And losing him going into the Florida game – was a uh, was a really big deal. They, I, uh, I guess Dominic Robinson kind of yeah. Stepped he started. Um, it had a good game against Florida actually, and, and we'll talk obviously a lot about the 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 his final catch that he made that uh, precluded or you know it, it led to uh, PK Sam's catch. But that team overall, when you look back at it, it was the last ten win season for almost a decade, and so. I think it gets a little bit, and I'm even saying it now, I'm kind of downplaying that team now and its accomplishments, but they won the ACC. They only lost one ACC game. um, And their loss was their two, two of their three losses were to Miami. And that was a good Miami, not a great Miami. Really good Miami team. They should have beaten them in, uh, in the Orange Bowl. And maybe it plays different if it's not a monsoon in the game in in Tallahassee, but two of their three losses were to Miami um, I think that was a very good team. It had, obviously, Leon Washington, Greg Jones, Darnell Dockett, on and on and on. A lot of great players. Overall, uh, it kind of gets lost a little bit in the uh, in the pantheon of great college football teams at Florida State or great football teams at Florida State. But that moment in that game, this game in particular, I think all Florida State fans remember fondly because how brokenhearted Florida was because mm-hmm. of it. 
Yeah, I'm glad you, glad you brought up Carfonza Thorpe because uh, I remember that at the time, and I looked it up. At the time of his injury, he had 994 receiving yards, 11 That's touchdowns. Funny. Yeah. So, I mean, one more catch, and he's got a 1,000-yard season. And he was being talked about as a potential first-round draft pick. He was going out early that year. He was a junior. Yeah. He's going to go out early, first, second-round draft pick. So, I mean, he's, you know, right up there with Leon and those running backs, one of your best offensive players, and he goes out for that game. And he just – he never seemed to be quite the same to me after he came back from that broken leg. It's a shame that happened to him. Now, Corey, talking a little about the rivalry at this point. At this point, Florida State owns the rivalry. Absolutely. They had won, I believe, four out of five going into this game. And uh, what's crazy is they won – yeah, they won four out of five going into this game. Uh, yeah. After this game, did they beat them uh, – maybe this made it four out of five. After this – No, this Florida made it five on, out of six. This Florida goes on to win six. six straight after this because, remember, yeah. you, had, you had the uh, Ron Zook final game – in Tallahassee the next year, which they never should have lost. That's a ridiculous loss. But then it's the whole Urban Meyer era and mm-hmm. Tim Tebow, and we don't even want to talk about that. But then Florida State goes on after that when Jimbo Fisher arrives and wins seven out of eight. So, I mean, it's crazy to see how streaky this rivalry has been back and forth for a long period of time. But obviously this was this was a huge game. This is Both teams were so evenly matched going into this game. Obviously, I think there were five lead changes in the game. Uh, so it was it was a great game despite what all, you know, all the complaining from all the Florida fans. Yeah, and I think a lot of that, you know, they had – if you go back and watch that game, and I know people that were around back then following Florida State or rabid Florida State fans, I'm sure you remember the uh, – there were a lot of almost fumbles and almost things that happened where Florida fans just felt they got cheated and got swindled and got robbed because it was an – I think was it, it was an ACC crew, I think. Right? Correct, it was. It was the last time they had an ACC crew. They used to alternate with the – road I guess officiating crew you know officiating the game at the visiting stadium but so after this Jeremy Foley was so mad that they switched it so that's it's now the home officials got their own crew which was nonsense it just nonsense I don't know if it went back to two years prior when um was it Darnell Dockett that tried to stomp on Rex Grossman's hand yeah yeah uh there was another thing where he's like trying to wrench a knee and I don't think he was even called for those penalties so maybe it stemmed from that too but uh but, yeah, it, it was ridiculous. There, there was one bad call. There was one missed call. And you know what? Those happen in college football games. Trust me, the, the notion for a Florida State fan that the ACC crew is trying to take care of them, <laughs> you make everyone, everybody in Garnet laugh. That was not the case. There was one obviously wrong call, and it was a Cromartie fumble, I think, early on in the game. It was the opening kickoff. There you go. That's as early as you could be in a game. <laughs> and, uh, so, and so and he was, da- he was not down. Florida recovered it, but he was called down. Other than that, from Leon Washington falling on his own fumble to, to these other plays, it's like, no, no, they either got it right or it was really close and it wouldn't have been overturned. And it was just – it was so bizarre. It just happened to be there were eight, seven or eight calls that went Florida State's way, but they were all the right calls. And at the end of the day, Florida fans, you still had a fourth and 14 in the loudest stadium in America. All you had to do was stop Chris Ricks from completing a fourth down pass – to Dominic Robinson, and you win that game. But you didn't. To Dominic Robinson, uh, who had just been playing receiver, I think about 12 minutes before that game started. So that's how they. That's why they lost the game. Florida State put up 34 points. Leon Washington was great, um, like he always was. And then PK made the, the biggest play of his career, the most – I think that's even his, uh, his Twitter handle because of that. I think he's the gator killer is, is, <laughs> is his Twitter handle because that's such a memorable play. Um, it's not just memorable that it beat Florida. It's if you listen to Mick Huber's call on YouTube and go find it because it's awesome. PK Sam, like he just feels like he's crying into a cereal um, because they were talking so much trash just two plays before. Like, let's see what you got now, Chris Ricks, Jeff Bowden on fourth and fourteen. Two plays later, you're losing. So that's that that made it awesome too. I really think part of it was you kind of snatched victory. Florida felt like they had you beat. They probably didn't even deserve to win the game. They, they, you were up 17-6 at halftime. Um, then they come back, take the lead. You take the lead. They retake it with, a, I don't know, a minute and a half, two minutes to go. And you feel like the game's over. And then, uh, yeah, and then you lose to, uh, to, to P.K. Sam and Chris Ricks. And that's, I think that's what made it extra sweet for Florida State fans was not only the, the win in the final minute, but kind of breaking their, breaking their hearts. Well, Corey, to follow up on this, because I, I, we talked briefly, I think, one of our other shows about the 2003, some of the officiating stuff, and the, the Gators call it the swindle in the swamp. 
And uh, I remember vaguely, so I researched it. I thought there was some kind of other like review done by some officials. And I actually found a credit to the Florida Times Union, I believe, was one of the state newspapers anyway. They followed up on this. And at the time, Jeremy Foley, who, who was the then athletic director for University of Florida, complained so much that he contacted the head of ACC officiating. That was Tommy Hunt at the time. And he got him together with the SEC head, which was uh, Bobby Gaston, Gaston at the time, and had them review tape of that game and the film they had. So they went through, there were six plays that they complained about, and they reviewed all six. And this includes the SEC director of officials. They said, as you said, five of the six, even though an SEC guy confirmed five of those six calls were correct. And as you said, the Cromarty fumble was the only one they said the officials got wrong. Like you said, you call an entire game like this, you miss one call, that's par for the course in officiating. So again, it, it's kind of a, an urban legend. It's wrong. It's a, a myth Florida fans have perpetrated because frankly, they blew Like you said, they lost a game. They, sh- they felt like they should have won. They blew it. So they're going to blame the officiating on a lot of close calls, but for the most part, five out of six were right. Yeah. And that made five out of six wins for uh, Florida state, which I, you know, I hope they enjoyed it because they wouldn't beat Florida again the rest of the day. <laughs> Um, but PK beat them twice. PK uh, was on the team in 02 and 03 when they, when they beat Florida. And that was also uh, Chris Leak's freshman year. I believe. It was, yeah. Freshman quarterback on that team. And, um, yeah, it was just uh, – obviously, they, it was Florida. And, you know, if you look at it, I guess it probably wouldn't have mattered for Zook's tenure if he wins that game. I don't know. But if Florida holds on and wins that game to beat Florida State and then he's, and then he's beating them the next year too, so three out of four years he's beating Florida State, I wonder if he keeps his job. Yeah. I know he had already been fired before the Florida State game in 04, but maybe if he had beat – maybe that buys him – Well, they would have been a much better bowl game. I remember when you watched the broadcast, they're sitting there talking about how important that was. Of course, while they were competing for the SEC, they were still in the mix with Tennessee and Georgia for that side of the conference. And they also were saying they would get in January bowl game if they beat Florida State, who had already won the ACC and was going to go into BCS Bowl. So it would have been huge right. for Florida – and, you know, looking back, Corey, maybe they should have thrown the game because maybe Urban Meyer never comes to uh, Florida and maybe Tim Tebow's never there either. Yeah, I mean, hey, that would have been <laughs> – no, Tim Tebow would not have been there, but I think Urban Meyer was even more important than Tim Tebow. So if you'd have kept him away from Florida, uh, that would have been probably uh, – uh, Florida State fans would vote for that. I don't know. I think they'd probably vote for that in a heartbeat, right? You would, you would lose this one loss. If it meant yeah, I think so, because then you probably deny Florida a couple national championships. Yeah, I don't think P.K. PK would, Sam would vote for that, though. No, no. He likes the way it ended up. No, I mean, and we and Florida State fans still have a wonderful memory of, uh, again, not only beating Florida down there and wrenching their hearts on having them to this day still complain about thinking they were cheated when we all know they were just – they're full of it. They were not. All right, Corey, good stuff talking about this. And uh, now we're going to go ahead and bring on – he's going to join us to start of the game, and that is wide receiver – P.K. Sam. Welcome back to War Chanting, or War Chatting. I keep calling War Chanting because it's War War Chant, but uh, this is the War Chat session. We're talking about the 2003 Florida-Florida State game. We have to have the guy, the man, from that game, and that's, of course, P.K. Sam. And uh, welcome to War Chatting, P.K. How you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. Thank you guys for asking me to do this. Well, before uh, we even start, I just want to see how you're doing. I know it's a difficult time for everybody, and I uh, hope you and your family are doing well and uh, getting through this, being healthy, and, uh, you know, getting through it. Oh, yeah. So far, so good. The only thing killing me right now are my allergies this time of year. So, um, But, you know, um, we're really blessed, uh, really not affected by it at all, um, health-wise or financially. So that was a huge blessing that both of our jobs are – able to keep going um, through this. So so here we are, just another day enjoying sitting on the porch, watching the kids ride their bikes and, and kind of hanging out. How's the, uh, how's the digital learning going in the Sam household? <laughs> yeah, so one kid, um, well, my stepdaughter, she's not uh, even a little kid anymore. She's graduated, so that doesn't really count. But one kid loves it. He wakes up. Uh, Seven in the morning, he's done by nine thirty, wow. and then, and he's done for the whole day. Then the middle child, Trey, is a lot like his dad, where somebody has to just be on him all mm-hmm. the time. So we'll we'll look up, and it's four thirty, and he still has work to do. So um, it, it goes both ways. But you know what? It's fun. It allows us to um, be more involved. You know, we yeah. already thought we were involved, but now we're really involved, and um, 
it also, you know, um, makes you appreciate teachers and thanking them for dealing with our bad kids for uh, <laughs> multiple hours a day. Yeah. No, but no, it's going, it's going well. You know, grades are way better, surprisingly. Well, oh, there you go. That's nice. That's it's a crazy positive. how he, he's a straight-A student right now. It's amazing. <laughs> awesome. Now, talk about 2013. Now, you got to Florida State, and you must have instantly caught on to what a rivalry this was between Florida and Florida State. And uh, this was your first year as a full-time start. I guess the first two years, they were one and one. You guys have won one, lost one of the Gators your first two years. So you're going to this game. You're down in Gainesville. I mean, what is the feeling that season and going into this game? You guys at the time, I think, had nine wins. So you got a shot to get your first 10-win season really since you've been there. Uh, Florida was, you know, obviously pretty decent, had a lot of good players. Chris Leak was that year. that He was his first year starting a quarterback for them. So what was kind of the mindset your junior season yeah. at Florida State? Um, I just remember just being really excited. Like you said, it's your first um, time kind of having – leadership role in the rivalry um you know your your freshman year you're just kind of there um you I scored but it, you know it was more like a obviously just a freshman role and then um the sophomore year uh you know Anquan was Anquan so it was a it was like the first time you really get to show you know why they recruited you and I remember Crafonzo and I were just um really excited that unfortunately like the injury kind of put more pressure, I felt like, on me. But D-Rob stepped up. So it was just all around, just really just um, – I felt – I just remember being really excited. Like, wow, this is the first time I get to go to Gainesville as, like, a leader. And, um, you know, just you're always wishing for a good outcome because you never know with, with a rivalry game what happens. PK, how confident were you guys going into that game? You had, uh, you had just beaten NC State the week before when Crofonzo unfortunately broke his leg on, the, I think, the second – or third last play. Last play, yeah. And then um, I believe the week before that or two weeks before that, you got beat soundly at Clemson. And that was not the Clemson yeah. of today. That was not a good Clemson team. No, that, that was a – Road trip that's a whole this another, game. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole other uh, war chatting event, the Clemson <laughs> <laughs> Florida State game. But, uh, yeah, we will put that one I, on our list. Yeah, yeah, for years down the road. But, um, no, you know what um, – I don't think Clemson broke our confidence. Um, Phillip Rivers was a great quarterback. Yeah. It, it, it was the worst situation you want to be in in a, a shootout with Phillip Rivers. <laughs> um, not what you want to do. So um, we survived. But we were, you know, looking back, I think we were still r- really confident. And, again, being a junior as a starter, getting back to 10 wins was like a huge um, deal for us. Just because when we got there, it was always – 10, 10, to, you know, yeah. like it was never less than 10. And then for the two years I was there, um, to not reach 10, um, I mean, it was embarrassing, you know. Um, just looking back at how great they were, it was just really embarrassing to go eight or four or whatever, nine and five or something like that. So um, it, we were just really excited and confident, um, you know. But like I said, it's a, it's a rivalry game, and you just don't know what's going to happen, especially when your leading receiver, you know, is out and you're missing a thousand yard guy. So, but uh, no, we were confident. We thought we'd go in there and, and win, and, and we did. Now, Pete, I want to kind of go through the game starting beginning, you know, chronological, and then kind of get your take a little bit. Of course, we'll, might be a big play at the end we want to talk about a little bit with you. But yeah. so, starting out first quarter, Florida gets up three nothing. Ricks drives you guys down the field, and then Dominic Robinson has a touchdown, a 35 yard touchdown to yeah, back in the yeah. end zone. I mean, this yeah. guy, talk about him a little bit because he made his first start. Because, like you said, Carbonzo mm-hmm. Thorpe, who was having an awesome season. I mean, he I think he had 994 yards, 11 touchdowns. You guys were a great tandem. Amazing. And all of a sudden, your, your sidekick is now out. And Dominic's yeah. got to make his first start in the swamp. So, what, what, what kind of – I mean, that's crazy. The first touchdown, he was able to get in his first start in Gainesville. Yeah, no, that shows um, – it just shows the type of guy, D-Rob, you know, he still is. I talked to him. And um, he was just a really unselfish guy, you know, being a huge recruit from Diamond Bar, California – um, you know, not really panning out like you thought he would be on defense and switching over and then having to just sit there and wait your turn. Um, I mean, it, it was a great it was a great play. Um, shocking because D Rob's not really known to take a top off a of defense and to go deep like <laughs> that. Um, you know, I, it was just it was just one of those I think um, 
something greater than us allowed that to happen. You know, D-Rob deserves something good to happen um, with all that he went through and the little California guy connection with Rick Sahim. Um, but, yeah, no, it was definitely um, – you kind of felt pressure off your shoulders because Crow and I were um, just one of those, in my opinion, one of the best – two combinations just because of what we added you know there's been a lot of great receivers but somebody who can run like that and then a guy who's my size with good speed who can kind of hold the safety for him just to blow by people um there really hasn't been that type of combination um in my opinion at Florida State but uh so missing him but then seeing D-Rod make that great play was just kind of like okay uh we could do this you know, we feel bad for Crow, but here we go. Um, it's time to just, you know, get this game going. Can you refresh my memory, uh, PK? I don't remember. When did Dominic switch over to offense? Was it before the season? Was it <laughs> in the middle of that season? No, it started earlier as soon as um, Anquan Bolden grabbed him in a drill and threw him about 10 yards on another field as a DB. Well, hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. He did no, that in the NFL really, to a lot of guys, too. Yeah, no, I know. I'm joking. Uh, no, it. Um, we used to tease D-Rod for that. But, no, it was really um, – they just noticed – it was probably, I would say, it started more sophomore year. But then, yeah, it was, like, for sure set um, that junior year, just that he was – he had better hands than hips. And, uh, you know, catching the punt returns he did, they just – it was an easy – switch to bring him over and help out on the, the offensive side. Because, I mean, obviously that helped you guys not only that game, but throughout the season. And, you know, you he, in college, when you get moved to position, a lot of dudes are just like, that's a wrap on my career. Like, I'm not right. – wasn't what I came here for. I mean, he was prime time too. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, like, this wasn't what he came here for. He, he doesn't know the position like he knows DB. So a lot of guys could just, like, shut it down and be like, okay, mm -hmm. It's not going to get a fair shake here. I'm not. I'm not going to contribute. But obviously, right. he did. Yeah. No. Again, that's just the type of person D. Rob is. Um, D. Rob was so his football IQ was so high that it really probably didn't matter what position he played. Um, he was at least going to be in the mix, you know, just because obviously he can't go play lineman just because size. But if he was big enough, he would have just because. Um, of his just, you know, his IQ. And another guy was Willie Reed. You know, they switched yeah. him from running back. He was arguably, to me, the best one before he broke his leg. But that was years ago. But he was another guy, you know. And um, those are the type of players you need on teams that start winning 10, 11, 12, you know, championship-type seasons is the guys who you get moved and you say, you know what, it is what it is. I'm going to make the best of it and uh, and still make it, you know, to the next level. So, PK, I'm going to work now. Second quarter, you guys swap field goals. So then they Florida makes a mistake, which they seem to do a lot there, and they kick the ball to Leon Washington. He returns mm -hmm. at 77 yards. A couple of plays later, Chris Ricks finds Matt Henshaw, who didn't really – not really an offensive weapon. Obviously, they were focused on the running game. They were focused on you. The middle of the field mm -hmm. was wide open. I don't know what you can tell us about that play, but really at the time, even watching the rebroadcast I saw on YouTube today, even the, the commentators were, co were complimenting Jeff Bowden. You didn't hear that very much for that play call. Right. You know what? That was another thing that um, Jeff, obviously, we know the history, unfortunately, with the play calling, but that was just one game that he was really, um, I mean, he he really called some good plays, you know, at the right time. And uh, Henshaw, and um, I, I actually, I can't remember what quarter, but we also hit Donnie Carter one time. And those are two guys who had, I would guess what, maybe you would know better than me, 20 catches, maybe combined, like, yeah, Did you know, Henshaw so, come I mean, in as a didn't Henshaw come in as a quarterback? Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, Carter so, came in as a defensive a D lineman. Uh huh. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. There's there's so many guys who just yeah. um, were unselfish and we and you know just waited for their moment and um, and yeah, that Henshaw play I think it surprised everybody because <laughs> you're like, wait, we have a tight end at FSU, so um, <laughs> you know, and it, it's not their fault. It's just we didn't really utilize. Um, anytime we hit the middle of the field, it was like a three wide set, and so uh, it was a, it was a great play call just to keep the tight end in close and, and hit them up the field. And Gene mentioned it to start that drive, but I mean, I guess you played with him, and I believe he was a freshman that year. No, he was a sophomore. But Leon, just what kind? Yeah, yeah. What kind of? I don't want to call him a physical freak, but he was short. Right. 
Um, he even looked sometimes like he had a little bit of a gut, like a little bit of a – Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little and roly he was poly. incredibly fast and shifty. He was. He was – Um, I mean, you know, freaks come in all different, you know, type of – he, right. he really was. He was so um, – he was sturdy, you know. He was just like one of the guys – you didn't know if he was going to run you over. A lot of guys who are shifty, you know, you're not going to get ran over, you know. But he was the type of guy, he had just enough weight and power that he would get you on your heels and then run you over also. You know, he ran really physical. It didn't go down easy. Um, and his career showed, you know, in the next level. He just kept doing it um, on that level too. So, yeah, Leon made some um, some key plays. And um, I kind of wish I had played with him longer, but he, he was a great little back. Yeah. So, PK, switch to the second half. Now, it gets a little crazy. You guys are up 17-6. You're in control of the game. The defense is doing their things. You've had a couple touchdown drives. They haven't been able to get in the end zone, so it's looking good. Then all of a sudden, the narrative shifts in that mm -hmm. third quarter. They score, I think, 17 straight points. They go up 24-17 on you guys. And I guess the key play at 17-17, I just want to know if you remember what happened at the bench at the time. Chris Ricks drives down the field, but then he's rolling out. The ball gets stripped. Florida returns at 77 yards, and they take the lead, and the Swamp's going crazy. I mean, what yeah. is happening on the sideline at that point? You know what? I, I Honestly, I don't want to lie to you. I, I don't remember because in a good and bad way, um, that has happened so many times in Rick's career <laughs> that you almost – and I, I love the guy. Um, you just kind of become, like, numb to it, you know, and you're just like, all right, well – it's bound to happen. You know, he, he's a risk taker. We have to, you know, get ourselves out of the hole. But, um, no, you never want to have a momentum swing like that. You know, it's, it's different if you get stopped on fourth and short. But you don't, you know, you don't want a big play like that, especially in the swamp. And they just – I mean, it got so loud you can't even hear, you know, what's going on on the bench because they were just – they were rocking and rolling by then. You brought him up, man. And I, and I was going to bring him up anyway. We'll talk about him now. He started for four years. Um, he had some good moments, including this game was one of his best moments, and I'm talking about Ricks. Um, I guess just he gets so – you look at – I was looking at that roster that you guys had. You had 27 guys drafted off the 2003 team, seven first-rounders. Now, some of them didn't play a lot in 2003. They were young bucks, but a lot. Right, right. I guess – I don't even know how to phrase this. Talk to me about Chris Ricks. So, there's – the young PK, um, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I say this correctly because <laughs> um, Ricks will drive you crazy, right? Um, we all know that. But as I got older and I went back and I watched film and I had better coaching in the NFL and, you know, I started studying, you know, stuff to try to coach uh, high school kids and train them. A lot of it was just, unfortunately, it was he wasn't coached up all the way. You know, when I say coach stuff, it's not the X and O's. It's when you do something dumb at practice, you have to get benched. Even if you know he's going to start in the game as a coach, you just have to show the tough love, sit him down. So, anyway, Rick's had all the talent in the world. Um, he was, you know, at times his worst enemy, you know, just like Rick throw the ball away, you know, stuff like that. But, um, again, that just – it goes to coaching because there were guys – Behind them that would throw the ball away. And, you know, sometimes you got to uh, have that healthy competition to make somebody um, snap in. But at the end of the day, you know, he he did the best he could do, you know, considering what was going on behind closed doors. So, And I, and I, and I just thought of this question as you were talking. So, for the people that don't know, Mark Rick recruited him. Um, in fact, he redshirted the year – Mark Rick's last year in 2000. And um, I guess – what do you think? What do you think his career would have been like if Mark Rick never leaves? I assume you think the kid would have turned into something. I mean, oh, one hundred something, but he would have been much better. Right, right, right. One hundred percent. Um, Mark Rick, Florida State fans should know if they don't know, he was a, a bigger piece of that puzzle than people, I think, ever imagined. You know, and when, and when he left, Georgia started looking like. Florida State in terms of just uh, right. throwing the ball downfield and and uh, guys I grew up with from being from Georgia, uh, 
Green and uh, Shock and all those guys came into UGA and just started lighting it up. Fred Gibson, that receiver. So, anyway, it just – Ricks would have been better. However, I think – Unfortunately, he probably would have never got as long as the least as he did. Adrian McPherson would have been a quarterback right? and would have won a Heisman. And I don't think he would have ever got in trouble. I think part of what happened with AD was he was just bored. And, uh, you know, he didn't know what to do. He should have been the starter, to be honest. And, um, you know, you just start – as a young kid, you just start doing dumb stuff. So, I think Ricks would have been better if he started. But I don't think Ricks would have lasted as long making those mistakes with Coach Rick. Right. So, PK, going into the defense, answers right back for you guys at that point. I remember Darnell Dawkins trips the ball at a phase in the running back for Florida, and then Matt Watkins picks it up, so, goes yeah. in there. Uh, suddenly the game's tied back up 24-24. You're going into the fourth quarter. You're in the swamp. Have you been in a situation? I mean, obviously you told me that how loud that place gets. When you're in a tie game against a huge rival in one of the loudest mm-hmm. stadiums in college football in the fourth quarter, what, 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 it, what is the environment like? What does it feel like on the sideline then? Um. It feels like this is why I signed my letter of intent to come here. You know, like, this is why it's no fun when you go beat up on Duke and Wake Forest and, you know, stuff like that. You know, like, you're like, this is it. This is, you know, why I came here. But um, I think there's two there's two type of athletes. There's either going to be the ones that crumble because of the crowd noise, and then there's going to be the type that's just like, this is amazing, you know. Thank, thank God for this opportunity. Hopefully, you get a shot to, to make a play. So um, we were, I know at least the guys around me, we we're ready to go. So you guys take See, the how lead. How does that work? They they take a lead. What what does do they kick a field goal to take the lead? Yeah, go? yeah. Florida take Florida kicks a field goal. Then you guys go on an eight play, eighty yard drive. That was the one you didn't mention. That Donnie Carter had a big play down mm-hmm. the field to set it up, and they actually scored. I think on a fourth and one on the goal line. You guys got in. On that one, then um, Florida comes back. They convert a fourth down, and they go ahead and take the lead. And now we're going to get to – there's uh, there's two minutes, 43 seconds left. And oh, I'm sorry, no, they scored to go back ahead. And then we, you guys have only a couple minutes left in the game. You guys have, are facing – and i got to ask you about this play, of course. You're facing fourth and 14. You're on it, and there's only a couple minutes left in the game. You have to go for it because I think you only have one timeout or no timeouts. And you it, you're done. So you guys go for it on fourth and 14, and we know it goes to Dominic. Again, Robinson came through D-Rob again on a play, yeah. but I don't know how much you remember that play or anything you can share with us on a that. A lot. Um, I, re- I remember the whole series. Um, we tried it. We missed me on a uh, kind of streak up the middle. Oh, that's, yeah, that's right. And you were actually – I was going to bring that up. You were actually open on that series, and he overthrew I was, you. Right, he overthrew me, um, which, you know, it happens. It was just uh, – maybe a yard too far. Um, and then the next play, he did something with the snap. I just remember kind of uh, waiting for the – you know, you can tell how the DBs react that something happened behind you. And you're like, oh, crap. And then it set up um, – or whatever happened, he fumbled. Then we tried to hit me, and then it was fourth and 14. So I kind of remember, like, it was just a series of, like, oh, my God, this is getting worse and worse. You know, like, something just happened. Then we missed me. And uh, they called the play. And to be honest, I was really confused why they called the play because D-Rob was the only one that could go far enough. His route was the only one that would go past 14 yards. And I had like a six-yard drag. And I'm like, this is the dumbest, you know, cause <laughs> knowing like I'm just going to be honest in my head. This, I'm like, this is so dumb because instinctively – if everybody drops back, I felt like Ricks was going to dump it down to me and I was going to have to do something stupid. So I literally didn't run my route just so he wouldn't throw it. I just remember, like, just don't run your route. So you're not even an option. And um, luckily – When you say you didn't run the route, what do you mean? Like, did you just stay at the line? Like, what did you do? I basically just stood at the line and just kind of – I remember I kind of just tried to hide where all the linebackers (laughs) are lying. I kind of just, like – because I just didn't want the ball. You know, there was nothing I could do if I got it six yards. So, I, I think I ran, like, three yards. Like, literally just hid and was just praying, you know, that something happened. And, uh, you know, to be honest, every athlete says they feel like, oh, we could do it. I felt like it was over. I was like, it is fourth and 14. There's no way with the play we called 
it's going to work, you know? Like, not like we couldn't do it. It was just what the, anyway. And then next thing you know, D-Rob snags it and takes a shot and holds it. And I'm just like a little kid at Christmas, you know, in my head, like, oh my god, and that's you know, that's my my boy, my my road uh, roommate. So I'm just going crazy, like D Rob. And uh, so then, yeah, we're back in business to at least uh, get another four downs to try to do something. Did you guys huddle, or was it was were you just going straight to the line? Do you remember? You know, I don't, I can't, I don't remember that. I feel like um, we huddle only because it was an incomplete. But I felt like he caught the pass. Did y'all hurry up back to the? Oh no, no, we um, I think we huddled. When did you know? I can't remember. What was the play? When did you know? Like, did he? Is he signaling you the play? Does he tell you the play? Like, when do you know? I can't remember all that. I just Uh, remember we called. It was the same play we had just messed up on. Right. And um, we just knew the coverage that we were gonna be able to hit that play maybe twice a game. Just you know. Um. Oh yeah, yeah. There you go. I don't know if you can okay, see it. I'm so doing a screen share of like, the lineup. I don't know if you can see that Corey and PK. So I've got yeah. you. This is yeah, this yeah. snap, and there's the so, route. And the guy that the guy that circled, I think that's Gus Scott, who you beat in the play before. So was that was that part of the thing then that you had already beaten him once on the same route? No, I actually think I I thought Gus was a further hash guy, but either way. I'm stemming at one of those guys and their rotation. I'm just going to stem right at them and shoot up. I can't tell if that's Gus or not. But, see, I feel like the guy you circle is going to shoot to okay. the flats. And then the, the corner and safety are going to bracket D-Rob. And then Gus is on the far hash. Okay, he may so be. Once you, so, once when I pass that guy, they pass me off. Gus is going to come down to me, and then I shoot up the field. And that's what um, – that's why I'm saying JB or whoever helped JB, you know, call these plays. It was just like amazing. But yeah, that was basically it. Even if that's not Gus, I'm going at him and I'm shooting right up the field. And it was only supposed to be about a 25 yard completion. And uh, um, Ricks, you know, didn't step up in the pocket, which is fine. He decided to roll it out. And then you could kind of sense, you're like, oh my God, he's about to throw it. And um, then, you know, you're just like, all right, well, all the backyard passes dad threw to you really high in the air. You know, here it goes. You you better catch it. So uh, you have that one moment in life usually where you either get to make a crazy play or, uh, you know, it's just incomplete. Everybody forgets. And I was lucky enough to catch it. So, Can you tell us, like, so initially it's supposed to be about a 25-yard route, you think? And then obviously I think – if I'm remembering correctly, he either could have run for about 25 yards because there was nobody over there, or there was somebody else open shorter. But it's Chris Rick. Oh yeah, yeah, right. And I was, so that should have, it should have never happened. That play, if it wasn't, if it was a more fundamentally sound play, sure, it would not have been uh, this conversation we're having right now. You know, it would have right. been just a a completion and you know clock whatever, and we probably. High up, or however, later down the road, or a couple of plays, but he threw it deep. When you look back initially to look for the ball to see if he's throwing it on time, and he hasn't, (laughs) is it just is it natural instinct to just keep going down the field? Um, yeah. So just just gonna uh, keep running, right? So just your um your rules of a scrambling quarterback, whoever is the deepest, you know, usually just stays deep and then you kind of fill it out maybe somebody's crossing and then you start coming back and you see you're out of range from the throw it you know everybody just kind mm-hmm. of finds a little spot and since I was already the deepest I kept going and I think D-Rob started working back or something like that down the sideline and um but yeah like I say I, you just you can sense the, the DB guarding you that the play kind of broke down and it you kind of hear the crowd for like a split second and then it goes uh, usually I just go deaf. I can't hear anything. But I kind of heard everybody go, oh. And then that's when I was like, he, he freaking threw the ball. You know? <laughs> so now – and I'm looking up in the air like, oh, my – and he, yeah, he lost it. And uh, at that point, it's really just the luck of a draw. Like, who's going to, you know, either catch it or is Gus going to uh, knock it down? So it missed his arm by probably an inch, maybe – what is that moment like, though, for the people of us that have never played a game in front of 85,000 people when the ball's in the air like that? You said that it, you can sometimes go deaf. Does it really – like you hear these things about people getting – it gets real quiet. 
in mm -hmm. the ball and everything else is shut out. Is that true? What is that moment well, like when the ball's in the air? It is like um, – it's like a movie, like when somebody just hits slow motion, you know, it's really just like hanging up there. I think your adrenaline is just so heightened, you know, everything just like you can't hear, you're not, you know, it's, it's just a weird feeling. Unless you've been through it, it's really hard to explain. But, yeah, you definitely can't hear anything. And it just everything is just real slow. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. right when you either catch or drop it, it's like everything just goes back to normal. But, uh, but yeah, it was just – I mean, my head is still hanging up there, and I'm like, oh, crap, you got to catch this. You know, hey, like, if I close my eyes right now, it's still just hanging up there right. in the sky. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I mean, it's like being a little kid. Like, Hail Mary, you know, go deep. And, and yeah. just got to make a play. So. so, PK, I always like bringing this up to you because if you, if you watch the replay, you, you catch the ball, you're running out of the back of the end zone celebrating, and this German shepherd that's held by an yeah. officer on the sideline, that, that thing jumps at you. I mean, if you wouldn't have held that thing down, it's going to grab onto your leg. I guess, did yeah, you I know. realize at the time and later you saw film, this dog almost bit you? Yeah, somebody um, told me about it. I had no idea. And I always joke around now saying if I knew how bad my NFL career would be, I would have gotten bit by him to get some money. <laughs> so I would, my bank account would look better. But, uh, no, I had no idea. It just it scared the dog. And um, thank God, yeah, the officer was, you know, holding him because he would have – Took a chunk out of something, but um, but yeah, it just it kind of even added more to that that moment that the security dog for the Gators was trying to like lunge at me and take me out. But uh, no, I had no idea he was right there. Um, when it happened, I was just excited. I turned into like a six year old kid just running around like an idiot, just happy. Did you know in that moment, PK, that I mean, you know how big Florida Florida State is, and that was a touchdown. I think with fifty something seconds left. In a game, two top ten, top eleven teams. Did you have any idea in the moment how long it would last? Number one, and can you can you appreciate what a play like that? Like it's it lives forever. It's one of the Florida State plays, especially in that rivalry. I mean, we're talking right. about sixteen and a half years later. Like, yeah. what is that moment? What is that? Mo Did you know at the time how big it was, or were you just? Hey man, I made a because that was the biggest play of your career, obviously, and you had. Oh some, yeah. That was the biggest one. Can you appreciate right. in the moment, man? I just made a huge play on national television to beat the Florida Gators. No, you know, I, I was a really um like an innocent, uh, naive kind of kid, so I was just happy, you know. Uh, thank God I, I got to play, and um, I didn't really understand how big it was until after the game, Coach Dickey. Uh, Daryl Dickey was like, did you keep the ball? I was like, what do you mean that I keep the ball? He's like, did you keep it? I was like, no. And he just kind of was like, you know, laughed and patted me. And then my mom is the real emotional one. My dad, you know, is like the tough guy. He was the tough guy. And then my mom just came to me. She was like, PK, that's going to live forever. I was like, mom, what are you talking about? She was like, that's never going to die. And so she was the first one that really put it in my head. Um, and my roommate was like, you're rich. You know, he just uh, assumed, like, catching that play was going to make me, like, a first-round pick or something. But other than that, um, no, it just – it re at about 10 years was when I kind of looked at my wife, who hates it, by the way, because she's like, it strokes your ego. You know, I get to be Al Bundy <laughs> for a day every right. year. Um, but, uh, no, she doesn't hate it. She just calls me Al Bundy when it happens. But at about 10 years is when I was like, oh, man. This is amazing. Like this was a true blessing. It's never, um, for the most part, it's never gonna go away. And and I'm glad because as a little kid, I mean, I truly love Florida State. You know, some people go to school just because they're a good school. They want to get to the pros. But um, honestly, we could have gone O and forever at FSU. And even though that would suck, I would love Florida State um, mm -hmm. the same as I do right now. I w I've worn this hat. That's why I have a hoodie on. It's not even white anymore. It's like brown just because I've worn it every day for you know like a year just like because I'm in Ohio I don't have a lot of FSU gear around and I just I really love Florida State so it was a blessing and like I said 10 years is when I realized that oh crap this is you know this is a huge moment and uh, I'm blessed to have been able to be a part of it. PK you guys go on you win obviously that was it that Florida's not able to come back and do anything you guys win 38-34 <laughs> and I'm curious to ask you this because now, I'm sure you've talked to Florida fans about this. They call that game the swindle in the swamp. Um, 
You know, they, they, Corey and I talked about this earlier, really, for the most, almost all the plays that they thought were bad calls really weren't. It was even reviewed by an SEC head of official. They agreed mm-hmm. that all the calls but one were probably correct. But, I mean, looking back, does it almost, as an FSU guy, does it almost give you more satisfaction? That game bugs them so much that they've got to come up with these manufactured ways to try to dismiss it. Yeah, yeah you know, as a kid who, um, as a UGA fan at Florida State, you hate Florida either way, you know. Right. So, um, it was just, it was, yeah, it, it was amazing. And then what kind of really added to it was Gus Scott was drafted the same uh, year, same team as me. <laughs> and uh, we ended up roommates. We lived together. So um, when his family would come up, they would just, you know, jokingly, they would be like, we were trying to find you in the parking lot. You lost us so much money and this, that, <laughs> you know. So um, it was just really fun to be a part of, uh, I mean, one of the biggest, you know, rivalries in, uh, in sports history. And, uh, yeah, just hearing the other side of it, of course. You're like, you're like, it makes you even more proud to be on the FSU side. They could have guarded the uh, converted cornerback turned wide receiver on fourth and fourteen, and they wouldn't have had to worry about what you did. The there was, a, there was, yeah, there was a lot of opportunities they had to to win the game. So, um, you know, I I I love that it happened. Um, a little bit of me, just because I know Gus, I do feel bad that as somebody who was a great player, it happened to him. But that's kind of part of being a gladiator. Sean Taylor knocked me out. You know, nobody feels bad about that. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> You win some, you lose some. You was know, that that so, year? Uh, or no, that was the year before, that right? That was the year the before, North right. Uh-huh. So, um, you had to have a, the yin to the yang and vice versa. So, uh, that was, you know, the football guys blessed me for me getting my brains knocked out in the Orange Bowl. But, uh, so, you know, I felt bad for Gus, but like I said, it's part of the game. And, um, honestly, as a little boy, I would never have dreamt of being able to, to you know, make a play like that. So, I'm, I'm glad it happened. And, and I hope Gene it never I, dies. I hope, hope you know, it never it goes away. And Gene and I wanted to ask you, after the game, and look, you guys don't like each other. We get it. There's a lot of competition, a lot of masculinity on a football field after a close game like that. Where were you when the fight broke out? I was actually talking to um, a couple guys I knew from Live Oak, from Kyler Hall going to Live Oak. Half of all his DBs from high school went to – two went to Florida, one went to Miami. So, anyway, we were talking – to them, like, on their sideline, peacefully. Mm-hmm. And then one of them just, you know, was like, oh, crap. And you could hear, you know, the, you know, ah, you know, all the language going on. And the first thing I did was, like, all right, man, I'll catch you later. I threw my helmet on, buckled it, and then started running, like, to get out of there. Just because I wasn't a guy who um, – I wasn't doing all that. And to be honest, once when Crow broke his leg, that's when I started thinking about going pro. So I knew, like – I already was going to be a, a risk to go pro, and you can't have any, you know, anything right. on your, your record. So I put my helmet on and started getting out of the way just so I didn't get uh, hit on accident. And, you know, you have to protect yourself and that looks all uh, wrong. So, yeah, we were in the middle of conversation. We were like, all right, man, see you later. Threw our helmets <laughs> on it and started running off the field. But, yeah, that was crazy. Um, I love when it gets intense, but um, – you know, especially now as a father, it shouldn't go that far, right. you know, where uh, it just it ruins all the positive that happened in the game. You know, uh, it was a great game, and unfortunately, you know, it ended like that. So. Well, if you were going to be in the middle of a brawl and you couldn't avoid it, I assume you get behind Greg Jones? A- absolutely. <laughs> if that's the one. <laughs> you, you picked them. Um, yeah, I, will, I won't go into all those stories, but, yeah, Greg is definitely <laughs> – Please do. Greg is definitely – no, no, no. <laughs> I know – yeah, no. I will, okay, well, I won't say a name, but I, I've seen Greg – we've seen Greg handle some business. And, uh, yeah. yeah, you definitely want to be on – What was it, he like, dude? Like, what was he like as a – he seemed kind of soft-spoken. Oh, he was the best – he was the nicest guy. But those are the guys, right? Like, yeah. Once you push their button, you know, shame on you. He asked you four times to stop, you know, and uh, – <laughs> Anybody that looks like God set them on a pedestal and chiseled them, once when they tell me to stop, I'm going to stop. So, yeah, um, smart. But some people, some people don't, and uh, we have some good stories to talk about. But, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, no, that's funny. Yeah, definitely. I'm finding Big G. Where's number six? You know, <laughs> yeah, he'll still protect I, me. Big brother, I'm going to hide behind one of his legs, you know, as big as he was. You know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, but you know what? It was, uh, you know, kids are going to be young. We're not kids. Young men are going to be young men and uh, – 
you know, the fight broke out, but uh, luckily nobody got seriously, seriously injured. And um, I guess that's Florida, Florida State. Florida. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, PK, good Hopefully stuff, we get to Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I was just saying, hopefully we get back to that level where um, – not where we're fighting, but, you know, that rivalry's fun when both teams are top ten and, and rolling and um, – it's just good for college football, so hopefully we get back there soon. I feel like that was the last one of those games, to be honest with you, when both teams were – Yeah, 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 because you keep – And they were both top forth. ten at the same time. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. I can't remember either we're killing Florida or they're killing us. Yeah. And it hasn't um, hasn't been very even to my knowledge yeah. either uh, since then. But at least it's not as bad as up here, Ohio State, Michigan. That might be a great line. Yeah. Ooh. That might as well not be a rivalry anymore. So. Harbaugh gets a lot of money to lose to those guys, like get beat by a drum every year. Man, it's just ownership now. It's not even a, a rivalry. They just own them for real. So, but no, I, I'm rooting for Florida State and all the, the new changes and um, wishing everybody, you know, stay safe, but that we can figure out something quickly so we know if we're going to have a season Absolutely. or not. So, Absolutely. Um, but, uh, so yeah. But yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate it. No, oh, no, we appreciate it, man. Uh, I, it's incredible to have you on here. I know that a lot of FSU fans love reliving what's one of the great moments in FSU history. And I uh, hope you're staying safe, you and your family. Yes, sir. And with yes, Corey and I will owe you a round of, let's say, sodas at the uh, our favorite yes. watering hole next time you're in Tallahassee. So uh, please definitely. Look us up. Okay. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. I honestly, I appreciate you guys. Um, you know, just being up here. And Buckeye country is always great to uh, talk to some noise. So, uh, right. and good for you guys for thinking about doing this so fans can have something to kind of watch since there's nothing current going on. So, uh, thank you guys for, for thinking about this. Hey, we'll call you back when we're going to do the 2003 Clemson game. Yeah. You yeah, can tell us all yeah. those stories. <laughs> yeah. You need to call the whole Florida State team on that <laughs> one. That, that could be a, a small documentary because that was yeah, a wild. Sure. That was a weird game, but um, it is what it is, right? So, um, I don't know. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut on that one. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> Thanks, All right, guys. guys. All right. I'll talk to you all.